Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 686. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is September 14, 2021. All right, welcome back to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us, and we're glad you've been faithful viewers for so long. We know there's a lot of new people who are trying to catch up. What's this all about? And this is basically where two people sit down and talk about the news, mostly Anglican, a lot of it Christian, some of it secular, that happens around the world each week. And George and I just sit here and pontificate about what we see, what we think, and for some reason we have a lot of viewers that tune into that. We really appreciate that. We also have a lot of viewers that go to the comment section and they comment on what we think and uh, what we say, <laughs> what they see on Anglican Scripted and Anglican Inc. And we appreciate that as well. And we're going to talk about comments today, George. Uh, so please, if you are watching the show, like it because that's free advertising for us on YouTube and Facebook. If you want to listen to us in audio only format, we have a podcast. If you had not subscribed yet, please subscribe because when I get to 10,000 subscribers, and I can't believe I have to say that number in this modern age of million subscribers, uh, I get to uh, raise money as a not for profit on YouTube. So that'd be really cool. So just click that subscribe button. And if you have not shared Anglican Unscripted with your friends, family, or foe, now's your chance. Now's your chance to show them you are a person, you're somebody, because you like Anglican Unscripted. George, what you been doing this week? Busy times, busy stuff, preparing for the fall season down here in Florida. This morning, the weather finally broke. The humidity was low. The sun was shining. It wasn't wet when I got up this morning. And so I'm getting, with COVID, so many of our projects and our outreach programs, essentially everything shut down. Either we would visit orphanages and uh, nursing homes and they've all been locked out and all the various act group activities have all stopped and I'm starting to rebuild them, basically putting in the skeleton. So once the people arrive and once the, the pandemic's truly passed, we have existing standing structures that can be sort of revved up quickly. Because otherwise, Kevin, when you get fun, you and Jill finally get down here in the in November, you'll walk into church and say, "Hey, where is everybody? What's ever, what's happening?" <laughs> yeah. And if I don't start now, then it's not going to be anything. No, no. Then here's the reality: we're getting into the middle of September, and uh, it's time now. I I have a big tree right outside the RV here that is half orange, half green, and that means winter's coming. And Jill and I don't want to be in Wisconsin or anywhere in the north when the ice and the, and the rain and the snow hits. So we're heading south. We're going to hit Kentucky, and I think we're going to hit uh, Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida. And hopefully by November, when it's really cold up here, we will be in our nice, warm property down in Webster, Florida, middle of nowhere. Um, that's that's our plan. We'll have to see what happens <laughs> if we have another breakdown or something. You know, that's that's just RV life. George, uh, I see that in our pre-show we forgot to do something very important. So we're gonna have to, from our memory, pull up a good news story. And I could do we the do appeals have... court. You want to do the appeals court? Yes, that that could be a good news story. Or we could do that comment. Uh... Yes, do the comment one. We'll do that one. Well, in our last uh, episode, we talked about Justin Welby uh, cutting back on his meat consumption because of greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. Evidently, cow flatulence causes the uh, ozone layer to be depleted, or terrible things happen when cows fart. And one of our viewers, who is a French-Canadian, well, he writes from Canada, and he has a French name. Very French so I'm name. I'm assuming he's a French-Canadian. He's written and many he's times, a, and we love his comments. And he's a PhD. He's written that there's now a program, and only the Canadians would do this, by the way, to toilet train cows, it's to reduce the amount of flatulent emissions. <clears throat> so if we adopt the Canadian toilet training program protocol for cattle, mm -hmm. we will be able to eat as much meat as we want without worries that the earth will end because of cow farts. So well, I, I really want Justin Well, because the man's so skinny and he's he, he, needs, he meat. needs meat on his bones. He's Get not some a manly looking man. <laughs> and, you know, our Brazilian viewers and Argentinian viewers would agree the man needs more animal protein in his diet. 
and I don't want him to be morally compromised. But now knowing what we do about Canadian cattle toilet training, yeah. I think I think there's a way forward for the good Archbishop. Well, the, really the, the technology is sound, George, because we have Skylar here in the RV. The RV is 300 square feet with the, the slides closed. It's pretty tight. And Skylar goes into the cat litter box, and if it's if it's fresh litter and all that, we don't smell a thing. You know, Skylar can have a really messy day. We would never know. So we, if you apply that to cattle, like they're doing in Canada, I think the solution is is well at hand. And, and Justin Welby can once again enjoy the mini cuts of meat, the sirloin, the ribeye, uh, the porterhouse. T-bone's pretty good, kind of a cheap cut. But, you know, that's the good news story we have on Angry Hood Unscripted. Uh, a lot has happened. Well, we, have another, we have another good news story, too, but it is not as earth changing no. <laughs> as cow flatulence it's more of a texas story sure but you know texas Cows, cattle steer big hats it all sort of comes together in a way yeah the appeals court um has said that the episcopal church who lost the fight in court for the churches has to do something other than steal the furniture as you may know from reports on Anglican.inc and here on Anglican Scripted, that when they lost their court case, they got the moving vans and they took the pews, the altars, uh, the books, uh, everything within the church, they, they, they hauled out, hoping that they could uh, uh, fight for that somewhere. The appeals court says, uh, no, you lost. And I don't know what's going to, if we had a, any response from those churches as to what they're going to do about it, but. Uh, uh, you can go up to the Supreme Court again, I suppose, of Texas. Not going to have much luck there. Well, the the Episcopal churches in North Texas, uh, they, mm -hmm. they're not called the Diocese of Fort Worth anymore, the Episcopal Diocese That's of Fort right. Worth, Sorry. because that name legally is for <laughs> Brian Reed, Jack Eicher's diocese. Correct. Yeah. Those people loyal to 815 who've lost sort of adopted the strategy the Russians used in the Second World War. As the Germans approached, they disassembled the factories, yeah, burnt all them. the villages to the ground, and left nothing for the Germans. Well, when the lawsuits finally went the way of the ACNA-affiliated ACNA diocese, a number of these congregations did a Russian job. They stripped the churches bare. They did a better job than Oliver Cromwell and the Puritans did. Of pews, prayer books, uh, altar linens, furnishings, things that had been in the church for decades they took, as well as the bank accounts and endowments and the cash in the banks. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the, the real and uh, personal property, which in business sense means the non, the movable items, below, right. were found to belong to the acna related diocese well another another lawsuit and the courts said hey you know it says what it says it means what it means no you cannot strip these churches bare i don't think it got to the point where they took out the copper piping but it was that close in some no, of the churches I, I, you know the courts are like hey you won in court you won the brit bricks you won the sticks and you won all the contents you know, you have legal right to claim those, own those, and possess those. And uh, the people who lost in court said, well, we'll, we'll fight for every last uh, content, every last prayer book, every last uh, uh, garment we hang in our vestry closet. So, uh, you know, I, we'll have to see what happens after this. I would hope that they would get the moving bands back there, take the stuff out of storage or wherever they put them, and give them and the funds, the bank accounts, back to uh, Ryan Reed's diocese. So, Well, I'm going to be a pessimist on saying we're going to have to have accountings, and these accountings, some of them are not going to add up. No. Uh, oops, where did that drawer full of cash uh, go? Oh, I don't remember. And so this will result in more litigation, and somebody's going to be aggrieved and say, my great-grandfather gave that cross to the church, and sure. I don't want it to be near the ACNA. Well, I'm sorry. That well, was awarded to the ACNA. But and let's back up. You go back 10 years, there was a lot of negotiations that said, you know, this diocese is going to the ACNA. I would like to make an amendable uh, work with these churches that want to stay in the, the Episcopal Church. And they said, no, we're going to sue for every kit and caboodle here. Um, You're absolutely right, Kevin. So, Jack Eicher, 
Jack Eicher offered generous severance terms. He mm-hmm. basically offered an equitable divorce. Absolutely. But instead, the lawyers for the Episcopal Church in New York wanted all or nothing, meaning they wanted everything, and they just couldn't imagine that they'd get nothing. Well, they got nothing, and nothing means nothing. And it was their choice to fight on that battlefield, Correct. not mm-hmm. the ACNA diocese's choice. Mm-hmm. So, again, the only people who've come out well from this are the lawyers. And as Alan Haley pointed out in uh, Jeff Walton's excellent article, 50 odd million spent by A15 and another 150 million perhaps by the diocese across the country. For what? Hmm. For what? How is the gospel, how is the gospel proclaimed by enriching lawyers? Yeah. Yeah, that money could have been so much better spent uh, in the mission of the church and growing the kingdom than enriching lawyers, their practices, and uh, people connected to 815. There, I said it. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, George, we got some other stories here. Uh, it's been a bad spring summer for GAFCON, and it's not getting any better as far as uh, things that they have agreed to on paper. We have the papers. Uh, but there's now a third women bishop that's been consecrated uh, in the province of Kenya. And I thought, yeah, it's time to talk about that and how this is going to relate to GAFCON and uh, some secret moratorium that we weren't aware of uh, was agreed to and has expired. There's a lot here, George. Well, tell me her well, name and where she's from and what happened. Well, the Bishop of Butere, Rosa Kano, was consecrated on Sunday by the Archbishop of Kenya, Jackson Ole Sap. This, now, is the, this is the first time he's done a consecration of a woman bishop, right? And this is the first woman diocesan bishop mm. in a province affiliated with GAFCA. But let me give you, let me give our viewers a bit of a, how did we get to this point? On December 31st, 1996, uh, the primate Daniel uh, uh, Bol, yeah, yeah. Daniel, Archbishop Daniel of South Sudan. That's perfect, yes. <laughs> consecrated a woman to be a suffragan bishop. And he and before this, there had been an unofficial agreement among the Gafcon provinces and their primates not to consecrate a woman bishop. And we actually had uh, a commission that was di- being started, led by a Kenyan bishop and assisted ably by Professor Stephen Noel, on women's orders in GAFCON because there are some GAFCON provinces that have women uh, clergy, there are some that do not. At that point, none had women bishops, and mm-hmm. the issue was do we go forward with it? Well, uh, the Archbishop of South Sudan, Daniel Bull, uh, went ahead and consecrated a woman suffragan. And one of the reasons he explained was that so many of the men had been killed in the violent civil war there that there were that this was the most well qualified person and the tradition of the church in east africa had been very egalitarian it was a product of the east african revival which was led mostly by women preachers Mm -hmm. so this was something that was culturally and for them theologically appropriate and they did it and then daniel retired and the new archbishop uh, justin body Rama of South Sudan said, okay, I'm not doing it again. We're not doing it anymore. There's a primates meeting and the primates of Gafcon said, okay, we're going to have a moratorium on this. We're not going to do it anymore. Well, basically close our eyes to the South Sudan woman and she's not going to come to the Gafcon meeting in Jerusalem. We're not going to basically have that to worry about. We're going to pretend it never happened. Happened. All right. And fast forward to this year. In December of last year, a woman was cons- elected a suffragan bishop in Kenya, in one of the dioceses that is in rebellion against Archbishop Oli Sapin. Meaning rebellion, meaning they want to go to the Lambeth Conference. They're happy to take money from A15. In fact, they're one of Trinity Wall Street's major uh, grant recipients in East Africa. And there was a, an election with a single candidate chosen by the bishop, and it was a woman who was dean of students at uh, St. Paul's Limeru, which is the seminary in Kenya. 
And in fact, she wasn't going to leave her job at St. Paul's. She was going to be detached from the diocese to serve at the seminary. And the Kenyan General Synod had affirmed its canons saying that, you know, women can be bishops. But Archbishop Ole Sapit said, I support the moratorium agreed by my Gafcon brothers uh, against women bishops. And so she's consecrated as a suffragan. She doesn't need his approval. So he didn't consecrate her. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to this summer, another election. The vicar general of the Diocese of Butere, Rose Okeno, runs against two other male clergy and is elected in the first ballot hands down. She's the vicar general. She's she's a well-qualified person. She was not a token appointment like the first suffragan bishop was. She was the administrator during the interim period. She was the vicar general. She was she had she's been there for 25 years. She's elected. And on Sunday, she's consecrated by the Archbishop. So at this point, Daniel, uh, Archbishop Jackson, Oli Sapit, can no longer say, well, this is a suffragan bishop, and I'm not doing it myself, therefore it's not really violating the things. He has basically said, at this point, the Gafcon moratorium is dead. Uh, I've agreed to it, but times have changed. Now, what does this mean for the Gafcon provinces and I think this is where most of our viewers are well, interested let's go back 10 years the kind of the forming provinces of Gafcon the strong ones the leadership Nigeria Kenya Uganda I think I'm, I'm pretty safe in saying that you know those were the stalwarts of the early Gafcon uh, Nigeria had great leadership uh, um, certainly uh, were very tedious in making sure that uh, Gafcon was put together well and run well Oh, and let's do Sydney too. All right, and so, uh, but just talking from the African continent, uh, Uganda was there, uh, well suited for uh, participating in Gafcon, and so was Kenya. Kenya was there as well, and a really strong supporter of the Gafcon movement, and how it would uh, raise up an Orthodox Church to fight what was happening in the Church of England, and America, and around the world. They thought this is this is the way forward. And Rwanda also, but Rwanda had the, I mean, the yeah, burden of coming yeah. out of the genocide. So mm -hmm. they were always there, but they didn't have the carrying power that Nigeria did, for instance. Right. Ten years later, that's all different. I don't see Nigeria as a leader in Gafcon. I don't see them, uh, you know, caring as much about Gafcon and certainly what, what the ACNA is doing here in, in North America. They've set up their own uh, congregations over here. They now have a cathedral in Houston. I, I think Nigeria is less concerned about GAFCON and they see and the ACNA as they were 10 years ago. And I think that's some of the leadership issues. Uh, Uganda, I think, is still the same player. Um, they've gone through some leadership uh, issues. They had uh, certainly a controversy with their last uh, primate. But they have survived that and they are still strong within GAFCON. Kenya is almost an eyesore for Gafcon. If Gafcon is going to have this leadership and uh, be somebody who's not in competition with the Church of England, but an alternative to the Church of England and uh, Anglican leadership around the world, you, you, you can't be doing this uh, breaking moratorium stuff, George. I, I don't see how that's going to help uh, the future of well, Gafcon. Well, let's just pause for a second and put ourselves in the place of Archbishop Jackson. Mm -hmm. Archbishop Jackson supports the Gafcon moratorium. However, he has a very sizable rump of bishops who are disaffected. And one of the things we Americans have taught the Africans is how to sue. And so if Archbishop Jackson refuses to consecrate a woman as a bishop, even though the canons clearly say she may become a bishop, his moratorium is not binding on the church as a whole. So if he refuses solely on the grounds that she's a woman, and with with bishop and with Bishop Rosa Cano, that would be the only grounds because there's no question as her merit. Sure, absolutely. He would then be sued, and and just like in Fort Worth, who wins the lawyers? 
and he's trying very hard to keep his province together and he is fighting a flood of American and English money less English money but American money into the rebel areas and that is destabilizing him so he has to pick which is the which is the battlefield he's going to fight on and he would rather hold the province together rather than split it and it was split along tribal lines because Rosa Kano is from Western Kenya and she's not a Kikuyu she's uh, from a different tribe and at the last general elections in Kenya if you remember a few years ago there was near civil war and it broke along tribal lines and the Kenyan church fought very hard not to be divided along tribal lines as well so Archbishop Jackson has to juggle holding Kenya together as a nation holding the church together as a single entity against forces that want to have you know a Kikuyu church uh, a church uh, that speaks Swahili in, in other words all these uh, forces are working against his authority and so he's got to take the path of least resistance that's how I would so I would not put any uh, opprobrium on him for weak character I was saying given this difficult situation he had to capitulate yeah he, he, he found state. himself in that position where I'm going to protect the province uh, uh, and we see that also in Nigeria who's having internal conflicts uh, certainly there's a lot of Islam slash Christian strife going on in uh, Nigeria we are uh, going to report this week about more killings that are continuing there's kind of I would even say a, a drip drip genocide going on uh, within the the bounds of certain uh, but, provinces within uh, Nigeria, George. Well, let, well before, we, before we get into the, the genocide, which is a major story, yeah. I think we need to give sort of a broader picture so our viewers understand, well, at least understand what we think. I don't wish to say this is the only answer. Uh, the Church of Nigeria is in trouble because the nation of Nigeria is in trouble. Kevin's mentioned the genocide. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the things we talked about was Ken, Kevin is a uh, is a proud gun owner. Uh, I'm not going to ask, are you transporting automatic weapons between state lines in Monstro? <laughs> or have you hid them in a safe somewhere in the ground in Connecticut? But uh, Well, one of the things is you read about, for instance, this past weekend, a uh, Fulani tribesman drove into a town on half a dozen Toyota pickups. Mm -hmm. Uh, with automatic weapons, uh, Kalishnikovs or something, cup festooned with bandoliers of ammunition, shot up the town, killed 11 people, kidnapped the minister in the town, and the body was found this morning out in the bush. Toyota trucks are expensive. Yeah. Have you ever tried to, I mean, go to the dealership. How much is a Toyota truck these days? Is it a $40,000 truck? Getting ammunition in Africa is difficult. You and I have been all over Africa. Every time we see a soldier or a guard who has a gun, we know it's not loaded because it's the ammunition like, is expensive. It, it's like Mayberry, Deputy Fife had one bullet for his gun. That's all that Barney would, uh, all that Andy would give him. Well, you know, that's the way it was yeah. in most of the, and who's paying for all this ammunition? Mm -hmm. Who's paying for these trucks? Who's paying for the gas for these trucks? For these guys to do a flying raid into a, into a Christian village and it's all one-way traffic. There's nobody doing flying raids into Muslim villages when pickup trucks with submachine guns. Yeah. And so we've got a, and we've got the Biafra movement coming back again, where in the southeast, the Igbo people who fought a civil war where millions had died in the late 60s are basically saying, and that's where the oil is. They're saying, why are the generals, why is the president in the north where there's no resources why are they taking all the money that's pumped out of the ground, leaving us with a polluted countryside and them with bank accounts in Switzerland? Let's keep the money locally. And then you have the uh, the Yoruba, you know, more in the Lagos area and whatnot, are basically saying, why, you know, why do we want these people uh, from the north telling us what to do? They're destroying the country. So you've got the centrifugal forces of division. The Church of Nigeria has fought very hard against this and keeps harping on the fact that we're a federal republic or a federal church and this shift of focus has allowed some elements to basically create mischief for instance in the united states yeah. so that 
Archbishop Foley Beach recently met with Prime, uh, the uh, Henry Ndukaba, the Archbishop of, of Nigeria, and basically saying, look, why do we have this grief uh, over, why are you, we, we're, we're going backwards in time, not forwards in time. Why does the Church of Nigeria need to have a diocese in the United States? Uh, do you not believe that we are theologically you know, back, you know, uh, on par. So there's that fight there. West Africa, the originally had been an original Gafcon province, the primate, uh, Justice Akrofi, retired. The new archbishop came in. He decided to split, straddle both fences. They had now have a new archbishop, uh, Cyril Ben Smith, I think his name is. He may go either way. Tanzania, do you remember Valentin Mokiwa? Uh, he was one of the original Gafcon primates. He was kicked out because he was dirty, uh -huh. and he really was dirty. It was, was corrupt. Dirty. Yeah. And Kenya and Uganda has been in a lockdown since June and won't be released until October. So essentially, everybody's locked in their bedrooms. So that basically leaves Foley Beach as the only guy standing, and the people in Sydney, because the the, the parochial problems. And it, let me just talk. It's not as if there's a concerted push by Justin Welby to do to de, destabilize Gafcon. Welby's doing a great job destabilizing the Church of England, but rather it's just there's a vacuum right now, and into the vacuum, leaders have not stepped, but problems have inserted themselves. COVID has revealed itself to be horrible <laughs> to both sides uh, within the Anglican Communion, both the Gafcon and the leadership out of Lambeth, uh, the ACC and whatnot. And we, we've seen that putting countries in lockdown, uh, stopping people from traveling, even though this is the age of Zoom, uh, has had deteriorous effects on major ch church leadership in every denomination. It's not an Anglican problem. It's a, a problem you find, out, you find everywhere. And so how, do, how does GAFCON recover from this? Yeah. Well, in my opinion, GAFCON recovers by getting its act together on the administrative side. Hmm. Um, Archbishop Kwashi has been recovering from prostate cancer, sure. living in Nigeria and having his cattle stolen every so often. So it's not as if he's able to devote himself with the energy that he once had. Mm -hmm. And in the office in the UK, we're getting nonsense. In other words, Oh, uh, earlier this summer when the Suffragan Bishop was elected and this Rose Okeno was first named, we went to the Af GAFCON spokesman because Andrew Gross in the U.S. is no longer the GAFCON press officer. And we said, what happened to the moratorium? And we were told, well, the moratorium expired in 2019. Well, we looked at the primate statement from the 2019 meeting and they reaffirmed the moratorium that they had before. So either ignorance or sneakiness is coming out of the GAFCON secretariat and nothing else. Yeah, um, well, I would say GAFCON as a movement has stalled. It's in a stall. And don't worry, your competition's in a stall too. You know, uh, the Anglican Communion is in a stall. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church is certainly in a stall. Uh, Lutheranism, I don't even know what they're doing with that transgendered bishop stuff. Oh, Lord, help us. You know, I, so I'm, I'm not like saying, hey, there's somebody overtaking you out there. But you, you have reached a stall, which in a plane is really bad. And you're at 30,000 feet, and you, you, the, uh, the, the front steering column is shaking. It's a wake-up call. You've hit your wake-up call. What are you going to do? Please don't tell us about my moratoriums. Uh, please just you know get your act together. Um, you know you, you're right, George. They need to 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 reaffirm, reassert because Gafcon one, two, and three were just wonderful events within the life and history of the entire Christian Church. Yeah, you know? and, and actually. I think I may have misspoken. There is somebody stepping into the vacuum, and that's the Global South movement. They yeah, had a meeting. They had a meeting earlier this year, and at the time we sort of said, "Hey, is this in competition with Gafcon?" And oh no 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 no! Oh, you can't possibly say that! No 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 no! Well, what is real? What has transpired? Is the Global South 
movement mm -hmm. that is basically doing stuff. It's Global South movement who is holding the bishops training programs. It's the Global South. Okay, I've kind of doing stuff as well, yes, but they are doing yeah. things at the same time as the Global South. What is going on with this? Why and just and Foley Beach is, I think, is the treasurer of the Global South movement and chairman of GAFCON. How it's like being, how do you do that? Oh. I mean, do they work in parallel? Do they work in tandem? They certainly have the same same goals. Why do we have these two groups? Why can't they be merged? Well, now, it was always said that it was because John Chu, the old Archbishop of Singapore, hated GAFCON and therefore until he was off the scene, but he's off the scene. What what's going on? No, it, it's time to to reunite uh, uh, within the leadership of uh, the GAFCON. Clearly, uh, and, and I don't want to speak out of frustration. You know, I, uh, what GAFCON purports stands for, offers in doctrine, offers an alternative, is the way forward for a broken Anglican communion. Um, but it, it's hard to watch you stall. It's hard to watch you suffer financially. Um, and it's hard to, to watch the internal problems with, within these other provinces affect uh, GAFCON as a whole. Um, but as far as the Anglican community itself, you, you have years to fix this. <laughs> Just, you know, I don't see much coming out of uh, the UK in in near times george we should move on we talked enough about kenya we have not talked about the report a bishop um uh, and dyer the torrance report was released to the public i now know why they didn't release it it is a salacious read you could make a soap opera of her tenure as bishop and i thought we need to talk about this um because this isn't just about oh she doesn't drive this isn't just about she's female and can't be a bishop. This is a, this is so much more about a person who doesn't have people skills, who probably should never have been a clergy person, who should have been identified early on as someone whose skills should be kept in the lay areas of life. Uh, she did some really mean stuff to some wonderful people and i want to start which what i call the hvac story a cathedral complained and said dear bishop we need heat can you help with some money for the furnace that went bad george <laughs> really bad you haven't you're absolutely right and friends go to anglican inc and read the torrance review it was mm. written by professor torrance who is the former moderator of the Church of Scotland, the former Dean of Princeton Theological Seminary. So he is not a conservative. This is not this report. One of the things he lays out is that people have been speculating. Aberdeen and Orkney is the one diocese in Scotland that did not want to do gay marriage. Mm -hmm. They voted against it. She was not elected. She was appointed to that diocese. She was a woman, the first woman bishop, and they didn't want a woman bishop. She doesn't drive, and this is a rural diocese that needs a bishop who's willing to get in the car and see people. None of those issues were what people complained about. This woman has the administrative skills of Charles Benison with the people skills of Tim Dakin, the Bishop of Winchester. This <laughs> I would say uh, and, and, the, okay. and the charm of Catherine Jefford Shorey. <laughs> sure. This is just a fiasco. Mm -hmm. Kevin referred to. One of the things this, she has acted in a way that an outsider would view as being someone who's very insecure. Yeah. She appointed herself head of essentially every committee and commission in her diocese. And some commissions, once she was appointed the head, she just, they stopped meeting. And an example being the cathedral, she's the head of the chapter of the cathedral and the visitor to the cathedral, they needed money to fix the heating because in Aberdeen it gets cold in the winter and it's an old Victorian, probably Stone silly, cathedral, but perhaps yeah. a, 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 <laughs> uh, a stove with somebody shoving coal into it. I don't know, but it needed money. Her response was to close the cathedral, close the cathedral, transfer it to another place 
So in essence, and then say to the dean of the cathedral, you can keep your job as the dean of an empty building with no congregation, but you may no longer call yourself the dean because it's no longer a cathedral. The organist, a young man brought up, hired to come north with a contract, was summarily fired. He's got a contract. Uh, and she just fired him. And because, well, we're going to merge our music program with the new cathedral I've chosen. Well, when he showed up for work, who are you? Go away. We don't want you. Yeah. You're fired. There's no merging. Yeah. And the dean of the cathedral was the only non-white clergyman. He was a South Asian Indian ancestry. The only non-white priest in the diocese. She, in essence, sidelines and basically destroys the cathedral congregation because she wanted to, didn't want to raise the money to fix the boilers. Um, what was the big deal about driving? Is that just we're being prejudiced against a woman who can't drive a car? Well, it comes into her people skills. She's got to take an Uber to visit the uh, parish and she wouldn't stay for coffee hours. She wouldn't stay and talk to the clergy and their wives or have dinner. She didn't do any pastoral work because well, I can't keep the Uber driver waiting. Because of that, she had no pastoral interaction. And so you had over a hundred people laying clergy in the diocese basically right to say, this is not about her being a woman, not about being pro-gay marriage, not about her being appointed and not elected, but not about, about her driving, not, not about, about her driving, yeah. but about someone who is a horrible bishop. And the response was from the Scottish Episcopal Church, Mark Strange, the primus was to not release the report. Well, the authors, but they previously said they would release it before they got it. Yes. Yeah. And that was uh, that was the understanding from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And they also had a human uh, HR, human resources professional, do another review uh, while this was going on in Aberdeen. And this human resources d d person wrote a report just as bad, saying this woman has violated labor law, corporate civil law, charitable laws. You know, she's just she's contract acting law. like she, contract <laughs> law. You know, she's just acting like. You know, I'm the bishop. What I say goes. There's no discussion, no conversation. I mean, evidently at the meeting when she announced the closure of the cathedral, she walked in the meeting, read a statement, and then walked out. No discussion. That was that. Then and, and then when this HR professional wrote a report at the bishop's request, she saw it and asked it to be changed to make it different because it basically was too harsh on her. Well, Mark Strange, who appointed her to be bishop, he's basically backpedaling and he's now attacking the unnamed persons for leaking this report to the Times of London, which forced the church, embarrassed the church into releasing it publicly. But now they're going to do another study. Uh, in, the, in Europe, we've had these views, uh, like we've had these votes uh, to leave the EU and uh, Brexit and the, the leadership, when they don't get the result that they want, they do another vote, uh, whether it's in Ireland or in England or in France, whatever. And Mark Strange is doing another report because he didn't get the result he wanted in the first report, saying, well, I don't hear all voices in the diocese in this report. I only hear about the bad things she's, she's done. Where are the good things that she's done? So it's just a case of mendacity among the bishops an atrocious person of, uh, uh, if this woman had any sense of the of the office that she bears she would have stepped aside for the good of the church um she can wear a purple shirt for the rest of her life but yeah she can't. but but the ability to boss people around that goes with it she'll lose well who, who was her means. example bishop i mean it, you don't just and maybe she does but uh, who did she shadow? Who did she look up to and say, that's the kind of bishop I want to be? Yeah. Jack Spong. Jack <laughs> Spong. <laughs> oh, you brought us to skills. the final score. Yeah. People In people skills, skills Jack Spong. Jeez, uh. <laughs> oh, yeah. So please go to Anglican. In fact, I'll put a link in the show notes right to that story. Um, well, George, let's hit, it, hit the, uh, the last story of the day. Um, the formerly notorious and now forgotten by history uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, Bishop Jong Spahn uh, has uh, died 
this week. And because of who he was, it's got a lot of reaction on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, the New York Times has lost a stalwart bishop. Um, and I thought you and I should talk about it, not in terms of it being a good story. This We saved this for the, the end. There was never, oh, this is going to be your good news story uh, that the, the wicked Bishop John Swong has died. No, not at all. You know, he was a person within the church that the church could not hold accountable and certainly led to um, some of the conflict and disarray you find in today's Episcopal Church. Uh, he offered a um, an idea about God that isn't found in any Christian tenets that I can see. And he was given a larger voice because he spoke, as we put on a story, as a maverick, as an alternative to the the... The, the Christian church that people were uncomfortable for. He says, well, there really is no God like that. And people wanted to hear that. And liberal newspapers wanted to proclaim that and say, yeah, see, we're not the only people saying that God isn't like the Christian God that you understand through the Old and New Testament. God is like John Spong says. And he wrote uh, 20 some books, certainly 50 articles out there. And in the 70s, he was almost a go-to mouthpiece for uh, who do I want to talk to who's going to offer me an alternative to the denominational church's perspective on Christianity. However, Kevin's first um, introduction to Joseph Spong was in the early 80s. I was reading an article, I don't remember the, the newspaper at the time, about a bishop from Newark who had a church that burned to the ground and somehow the filing for that church's fire insurance went through his office. And when it was time to give that money to the church so they could rebuild, he wouldn't sign the check. And he said, I want to be in charge of the building reconstruction. I want to be in charge of the plans. Everything has to get my approval. This is way before I was a Christian. But I'm like, that's wrong. Uh, what, <laughs> what's an Episcopalian? <laughs> That's how early this was. And, you know, that was my introduction to, to, to Bishop John Spong. And I've not heard any good story since then, George, of uh, his character, demeanor, books, uh, theology. And I want to talk about him in that respect, but I don't want this to be, oh, we're judging his eternity. That's not th what this is. This is Kevin and George talking about a has-been bishop because I don't see any of his uh, stuff being propagated in the Episcopal Church or around the world in the last 15, 18, or 20 years. It was a once and done. It, was, it wasn't even good Gnosticism. But you know more about him than I do because I want you to tell us the Andrew Carey story. Well, uh, before I get there, sure. I want to basically say there's several Jack Spots. Yes. There's Jack Spong, the writer. There's Jack Spong, the bishop. There's Jack Spong, the human being. Mm -hmm. And his, and I want to distinguish between those, because, and I can speak to all of them. Uh, Kevin is his fame and notoriety was such that you know when I was in seminary, I would see Jack Spong on the TV with Bill Mahler. Yeah. Mahler. Mahler. Uh, Jack Spong was at the height of his popularity within the secular world before the Lambeth Conference in 1998. He had written theses for a new Christian church. And essentially, Jack Spong, he denied the physical resurrection. He denied the miracles. He denied life after death. He denied Paul was a St. Paul, the Apostle Paul, was a repressed homosexual who hated himself. He, he advocated a secular moralism that he said was a rejection of the old fundamentalist Christianity out of which he arose. And for some people, this rejection of, this allowed them, if you will, psychologically to hold on to Christianity. If they came out of a primitive Baptist background and they stopped believing that there are no dinosaurs because they got on the ark, 
Jack Spong was the sort of person who will help them remain Christian. But they weren't really Christian. Jack Spong's books were dismissed out of hand by no less a person than Ronald Williams before the 98 Lambeth Conference, who basically said, the problems Jack Spong, po he, he wonders if Jack Spong really has thought this through, that Teresa of Avila or uh, St. Francis would have problems with the issues that uh, Jack Spong seems to have discovered all by himself. The answer, of course not, that basically Spong was writing basically on the level of a bright 14 or 15 year old in confirmation class. He and, was not a theological thinker of any strike. And that's why he was a one and done. You know, we're not discussing the great works of, of uh, Bishop Spong right now. So as a writer, Spong had a very wide reach, and but it was in a secular press, and mm -hmm. it was people, and he appealed to people, and I don't wish to judge other people to whom he appealed, but he certainly, I read him for the first time, saying, this man is an idiot. I mean, well, that's not fair. This man yeah. is, attacks, he sets up a straw man, attacks it with a weak argument, and then goes forward to the next straw man. Well, the, in 1998, Andrew I was writing for the Church of England newspaper, and Andrew Carey was their uh, deputy editor. And Andrew Carey did an interview with Jack Spong, recorded on tape. And this interview was published during the first week of the Lambeth Conference. In the run-up to the Lambeth Conference, there was such fear by conservatives. Bob Duncan told me he was more feared, afraid of Jack Spong coming out of the Lambeth Conference, the lion of the conference, mm -hmm. because at that point, Bob Duncan had his had the first defection of uh, I think it was John Guest uh, of his church in Pittsburgh leaving the Diocese of Pittsburgh because of Spong and company All right this is way before the ACNA the ACN or any of this stuff and already the defections over some were coming from Spong's notoriety well Jack, Andrew Carey interviewed Jack Spong and Jack Spong said uh, in at asked about the African church's more traditional worldview, um, essentially said they're just one, he essentially said the words, they're just one step up from uh, the jungle. They've just been civilized. Then you can't expect them to have the depth of theological maturity that we have. And this was printed and it caused a furore. Desmond Tutu, who was no longer archbishop, but still very, prolific in his pen, sure. yeah. denounced Jack Spong. Mm -hmm. And it was carried, and first Jack Spong denied it was true, that Andrew Carey made up a malicious lie. Andrew Carey had taped this. And we typed up the transcript of the interview, and we went around, and I went around with my wife Susan in the middle of the night at the Lambeth Conference to every bishop's door and stuck a transcript of the interview under the door. The next day, Frank Griswold went to Emmanuel Collini. Frank Griswold, the primate of the Episcopal Church, went to Emmanuel Collini, the primate of the Church of Rwanda, and apologized on behalf of the Episcopal Church for Jack Spong's racism. Spong had then a public meltdown and left the conference early. And from a pan-Anglican point of view, he was done. Spong well, yeah. added, him, added himself as a condescending, patronizing racist. Yeah, but he, was, was, he, he lost the literal view as well. He was no longer on Larry King. He was no longer on Bill Maher's show. He, you know, at that point, he had lost his voice. When, he, when it was revealed that, you know, he, where his heart was and what he thought of the African nation, that was, that was you know... That, he, that's Jack Spong, the writer, mm -hmm. and his influence on, on global Anglicanism. Jack Spong, the bishop, I think became bishop in 78 and he left in 90, I think. 89, 90, uh, I don't know. He, he saw a 60%, was it a 60% decline in his diocese attendance? Yeah. It, uh, and, and, hold they, on. and this is before hmm. Gene Robinson. We're talking about a person who took, you know, for all intents and purposes, a, a healthy, strong, northeastern, of all places, diocese. And suburban diocese. Yeah, suburban, suburban diocese. diocese. Huh? Not a, you know, for every Nutley, New Jersey, there's a Mendham, New Jersey, yes, you know. Uh, so, in other words, it's not all the rut, it's not Pittsburgh, it's not Western New York. Mm -hmm. It's the nice suburbs of New Jersey uh, where they filmed The Sopranos. That's uh, right. 
his para his diocese tanked in attendance uh, and this has been well reported and it it was at a rate i think if i remember correctly you can read the we can read the stories in anglican to get the exact numbers but at a rate of five to six or seven times the decline was faster than the episcopal church overall jack spong as a bishop was poison if you look at his numbers mm -hmm. attendance income jack spong was famous for pushing the gay issue but he also did it in a sneaky way uh he it's jack spong was the first to ordain gay clergy no, he wasn't. He had his assistant, Walter Reiter, do it. Why did he have his assistant, Walter Reiter, do it? So that Jack Spong would not be brought to trial. No blood it was on his Walter, hands. Yeah. Walter Reiter was the one who had to go through the trial for misconduct for ordaining a gay, a non-celibate man to the ministry. Mm -hmm. And after that trial was over, then Jack Spong was happy to ordain people in gay relationships people are new to the program quick thing with george Ryder. he was brought up on charges they had a nice thorough trial the house of bishops could not find within themselves to hold him accountable for working outside the uh prayer book doctrines and discipline of the episcopal church gay marriage was not a core doctrine issue Mm -hmm. They wanted to call it adiaphora, meaning it was outside creedal definitions of mm -hmm. Christianity. And so it was, he got off essentially on a technicality that this, this did not rise to the level of heterodoxy. It was more conduct that had not yet been approved by the wider church. So... It wasn't Jack Spong. Jack Spong was the man who took the credit. Jack Spong was the man who made the noise, but the actual man he sent into battle to actually take the bullet was Walter Ryder. Mm -hmm. Jack Spong, as a human being, was not a nice person, in my personal experience. He was, if you didn't agree with him, he was dismissive, he was rude, he was smug. He reminds me of these guys I meet at some ACNA meetings who wear plaid shirts and have beards, but they're Calvinists. Uh, that that he they, he has that that sort of Calvinist or Richard Dawkins type smugness that uh, you know opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, I'm friends. I'm only repeating my experiences, and I had experiences with Jack Spong over fifteen years. Sure. Um, now I have a personal statement. I was uh, offered a position in the Diocese of Newark um, when I was a young man and I uh, was refused by Jack Spohn because of my work at the Lambeth Conference. That's his right. Yeah, I, don't, right. I don't regret having gone to Florida instead of staying in New Jersey. Uh, I think that, thank you, Jack Spohn. Uh, <laughs> I like where I am. Yeah. But, so I, I, but, um, There's just so many stories about Jack Spong that, you know, people on the gay, in the early gay movement, people like Louis Crew, and I'll, I'll run through names that won't mean anything to people anymore, but they love Jack Spong because they felt that he had their back mm -hmm. and they were all, and they worshiped him. If you didn't, weren't on Jack Spong's team, you were either with him or against him in Jack Spong's worldview. And if you held to, uh, I remember a conversation I had with Charles Benison once, and this is about Charles Benison, not Jack Spong, but Charles Benison said to me, George, you're an educated man. For you to believe in the literal resurrection means you're either crazy or dishonest, because you're not stupid. Mm -hmm. And that, I, I will take the gamble and ascribe that worldview that uh, Charles Benison had to Jack Spong, that, he, that there, couldn't be dishon there couldn't be honest disagreement with Jack Spong. If you disagree with him, you are either a fundamentalist or you're crazy or you are just stupid. dishonest. Yeah. Or stupid. Or stupid. And, and th that is kind of that whole, you know, that is the atheism part of it. You know, that the, the tenets we hold into to our faith 
uh, found in the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and uh, 39 Articles in, in El- the 1979 Prayer Book, uh, 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 you know, don't call us um, stupid because we believe these tenets. Somehow, in the last 60 to 80 years, these gentlemen, the Jack Spongs, the Benisons, and others, were able to be uh, consecrated within the Episcopal Church as bishops, take those oaths found in the prayer books, and if you want to go look up what they defended, uh, their beliefs were in front of the House of Bishops, in front of a, a, a consecrating uh, audience within the cathedral, you're like, well, who was the real liar then? Who really lied about what they believe? I do not lie about what I believe. I hold to the uh, um, Christian tenets of faith. Uh, and it hasn't changed since day one. Uh, my faith is not lacking in that way. These people promoted highly within the Episcopal churches, and, and every denomination suffers from this around the world, are at some point lying about what they believe. And so when they get to office, the church is being destroyed. Did, did Bishop Spong destroy the Episcopal church? No. They have accountability. There's accountability in a, a process built within that by not holding Walter, Spong, Benison, and others accountable uh, for what they prof- profess publicly after becoming a bishop. That's what destroys the church. I'm going to take a bit of a contrarian view, because, but I agree with everything that you say, Kevin. Good, because I'm and right. I'm, ch- uh, we can end the program now. Why well, good. So. Oh, no, but I mean, if the church had started in the 1960s to hold uh, Bishop Pike of yeah. San Francisco accountable, mm-hmm. maybe some of this would have been overted. But Jack Spong and Bishop Pike and even Charles Benison were cultural Christians. Um, they were not Christians as I understand them to be Christians. And I've experienced this all through my ministry in the Episcopal Church and in Global Anglican meetings. Kevin, do you remember you and I sat down, there was a, uh, we were in Alexandria, Egypt, and there were at the primates meeting. Mm-hmm. And there was Greg Venables, and I think there was Emmanuel Collini, and Henry Arambe, and somebody else, and we were all sitting around And Greg Venables said, let's pray. And we sat there and we prayed together. Basically, we have every sort of shade of skin color, shade of uh, social, this, that. In other words, this is the, we were united as one in Jesus Christ. Do you remember that? Absolutely, yeah. And this sense that prayer was real that we were really in the presence of the Lord when two or three are gathered together, that this stuff is true, that this stuff works. You didn't get that sense of their having experienced the divine out of Jack Spong. This was, if you will, a genteel profession that he entered with good intentions, but he didn't have I don't want to sound all Baptisty or everything, but a conversion or a baptism by the Holy Spirit into the sense that this stuff is powerful, it's real, and I want to tell you about it. And that, and I think it's actually good that the Jack Spongs have had their day, but have passed away, mm-hmm. and are long, and that we're getting rid of so many of these cultural Christians. And I think it's one of the good things about COVID. I shouldn't say this because it's not good for a minister to say out loud, but the people who should have fallen away have fallen away because it's better for them to read the New York Times or play golf on a Sunday morning instead of coming back to church. Now, I want to win them to Christ, but I don't then want them to show up just because it's what they've always done. We don't want them to show up because they're expecting to hear somebody who agrees with them. We expect them um, to show up because they're seeking they're interested in what's being heard. They find uh, a uniqueness to the gospel that leads to them to have a transformed life that is found in prayer, worship, scripture, um, fellowship. And that's the life of the church. 
the the life of the church is not to hold up a check uh, due to a congregation who had their church burned down. If this the theological issue for me, um, and this is me, mm -hmm. is the priesthood of all believers. You know, in in uh, was it Deuteronomy that uh, the the people of Israel to be a, were to be priests, but they fell short, and so the Levites were given that job. Yes, they were. But in Jesus Christ, you know, there's a priesthood of all believers. In Char in Jack Spong, I saw clericalism at its most powerful. Of we are a professional class separate from you people in the pews. Um, that I don't see in well, I don't see in Foley Beach. I don't see any smidgen of clericalism. I don't see that in some of the best. Episcopal, Acne clergy, uh, cross theological, Anglo Catholic, Evangelical, Charismatic. For them, I see that pre sense of the priesthood of all believers being lived out and real. Whereas in Jack Spong, my experience of him was that this was a caste or a tribe. And I'm teaching you poor, dumb people the truth. And so, though he may have come across as patronizing and condescending to Africans, that's how we thought about working class whites. Yeah, it, it, That's how we treated people in Nutley, New Jersey, and East Orange, well, New it, Jersey. The thoughts he had of the Africans were thoughts he had of all believers. He considered you in that same plane that you just haven't figured out that's not God. And let me show you about the God that I figured out. And let me put it in book form. And, and reading the form, and we'll talk about it on Bill Maher's show in Larry King. And, um, you know, let this be the last that we ever have to talk about Bishop Spong on Anglican Unscripted and Anglican Inc. Because that era, the era of the Jesus Seminar, the era of Is God is Dead, um, the, the, the 1970s Time Magazines, the 1970s New York Times, uh, Washington Post era of questioning of that th that's gone we i've we've received lots of private correspondence on the spong articles mm -hmm. um that we published the uh we we went with the breaking news and then as i was writing the uh obituary uh john sandeman fraternity news wrote something and why do i need to reinvent the wheel his was great and he's a good writer so we put it out there and we've had a lot of uh private responses because i don't think people want to be on public record about Spong. And one person said, you know, that I'm of a generation where Spong was sort of my contemporary, and I remember John A.T. Robinson, which is the sort of God is dead guy, in the early 60s, and his theology was challenging, but he was a wonderful human being and a wonderful bishop. And he really cared about his clergy, and he cared and he wanted you to be saved, but what he thought was wrong. He was misguided, but he wasn't, he was a nice person. Mm -hmm. So you could sort of live with him. The difference with Spong compared to Robinson, Robinson was a far superior scholar, scholar, but also Robinson had a pastoral side with Spong, save for select minority groups, the gay and lesbian lobby. Spong did not have a pastoral uh, touch or reach to people who did not worship him or agree with him. Yeah. So, George, this just became the longest Anglican Unscripted in the history of our 686 episodes. I'm looking up here at the clock. It says 103. Kevin, do you have time for an Indian corruption story? <laughs> Clearly we do. Anybody who is still watching now is a diehard. Or you know why we saved the Spong story for our last story. <laughs> so I uh, do want to thank you guys for watching Anglican Scripted. Um, if you do get a chance, please like us uh, on Facebook and YouTube. That really helps. Uh, and that's it for Anglican Scripted. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 686 and a little bit of 687 <laughs> uh, of Anglican Unscripted. <laughs>